We're going to discuss the uh, preparatory phase of being an EMT or paramedic. Basically, the overview of the industry itself. Discuss how important it is to understand your well being, uh, the medical legal aspects of this job, and your patient's changes as life progresses. Um, and then how to communicate with our patients. Very important information. So this is just fundamental knowledge of what it takes to work in emergency medical services with the new national standard curriculum. We are all public health workers. And understanding that, understanding the um, nuances of public health, dealing with people um, from all different cultures, society, race, everything, how we can use a universal approach to patient care is vital, and that's part of what it is to be in a public health care arena. We have a, a, a lot of weapons and tools in our arsenal, and pharmacology, especially EMTs with the new knowledge that you have, new drugs that are out there, paramedics, the new drugs that you're going to have, the influx of um, new ways to introduce drugs into the body intranasally, uh, these are all things that you need to have a uh, consistent knowledge of throughout your career. So what is EMS? It's an integrated system of care. Okay? And then we're going to discuss the, the nuances, the changes of this dynamic industry and how it's going to affect you as a healthcare provider. So I discussed the National EMS Scope of Practice model. This is a brand new uh, curriculum that was updated in 2010. Remember, our original curriculum was from the, the um, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration Highway Act of 1966. And since then, there have been huge changes that have gone with the times of our, of our culture, our society, and we've moved on as an industry. We have actually progressed. So there are a lot of different skills that we're going to be doing. So we ba the basic lowest level, it used to be called Certified First Responder, it's now called Emergency Medical Responder. And it has the same curriculum, these are people that are, that are doing treatment, they don't necessarily have to be on an ambulance, you find them in police cars, fire trucks, and they also can assist, but they are not the lead person in the ambulance. Emergency Medical Technician has uh, basic life support skills, that hasn't changed. We've added some new medications. Uh, you may start seeing more medications out. Then we have our advanced EMT. Our advanced EMT is able to start IVs and administer certain medications based on local protocols, regional protocols. And the, the highest level of emergency medical systems is paramedic. So it's no longer known as an EMTP, it's now simply a paramedic. So if you're nationally registered, it's a national registry paramedic. So we're no longer considered EMTs at the paramedic end. We have extensive knowledge. We're actually we're going to be improving uh, this extensive knowledge with new skills, new training, uh, in addition to uh, additional uh, alternate airways, uh, in addition to intubation. We have new drugs, new ways to deliver these drugs, cardiac monitoring, point of care testing is in the future. These are all new things coming on for paramedics. What remains the same is the, the ability for the states to control their curriculum and expand on the national standard curriculum. The national standard curriculum sets the base and states and regions build upon it. So this is why you see some things that vary state to state. Now an EMT can perform skill only if it's been approved as part of that EMT scope of practice. That's very important. You never, never, never operate outside your scope of practice. And this scope is limited to what the medical director of an agency allows you to do. We have seen over the past 15 to 20 years and a real push to have community-based CPR. There's new CPR standards that are out there that, sh that are compression only for lay rescuers, and that's to, to get people to do more CPR, to be more involved in, in uh, patient care before the ambulance arrives. 
AEDs are now everywhere. You see them in, in health clubs, in airports, in restaurants. And this actually broadens our component of the EMS system, that public access, in addition to, of course, 911 and emergency phone numbers, we have these, these AEDs that are on site, we have people who are trained in how to use them. But we also need to have, for the EMS system to work, good clinicians, excellent medical direction, the way to integrate all of our health services together with trauma centers and STEMI centers and stroke catheterization centers. There's information systems, there's constant training. We work with prevention, bike helmet safety. There's EMS research, your documentation is used by a whole myriad of different agencies and departments as part of research. And all that this can do is add to your abilities and add to the um, nuances of EMS to change the system for better. Our communication system is expanding. We have digital networks now. Um, our HR, human, our human resources departments are able to make sure that we stay up to date with all of the current practices. We maintain CPR, advanced cardiac life support, pediatric advanced life support certifications, take pre-hospital trauma life support programs. A lot of the classes that are still part of the National Standard Curriculum but are more intensive and just broadens your knowledge base. And we have our, our regional advisory boards, um, regional testing, we have uh, the state, local governments that regulate and, and uh, control our EMS system. So all of these work together to make a state-of-the-art emergency medical service. We have our, we evaluate, we have our system finance, Some, someone's got to pay for this. We have the ability to bill Medicare, Medicaid through the centers of the Medicare systems and we have, uh, of course, private insurance with the Affordable Care Act. It's going to be a boom for EMS. There may be branching out to be able to do well care, community paramedicine, a lot of different things that are on the horizon. We move with technology. Technology is improving, and some people will say it's improving at an exponential rate. Everybody is comfortable using tablets, maybe not so, but maybe in a few years tablet technology will be such that it will replace paper altogether. And having this tablet, the ability to actually transmit data, store it properly, it can be analyzed much better, and that's going to improve overall patient care. We as, as EMTs and paramedics, we need to be able to be more involved in public health. We need to be able to go to communities and talk about things like vaccination programs and seatbelt laws and bike helmet safety and be able to be part of teams that go in and do inspections of food service facilities and health clubs. We need to be able to get more involved in this and you may be seeing this more and more in the future. Because really public health deals with not only responding to emergencies but preventing the emergencies from occurring in the first place. And who better to know that there's an emergency potential than us in the street being able to see unsafe situations and being able to report them. And EMS research, this is, this is all part of what we're going to plan on doing in the future. We need to be the ones who will determine the shape and impact of our own agency on the community that we serve. And we have a wealth of data that we gather from every single patient that we come in contact with. We're able to tell the efficacy of drugs that we administer. We can see the positive or sometimes negative outcomes of treatments that we render and being able to to save that data and have it analyzed for research purposes is only going to better our, our agency as a whole. And this is really a new type of uh, research that's out there. It's known as evidence-based research. We make decisions based upon what worked before in the past. 
there are some standard approaches that have worked effectively. There are others that, through research we found, have not worked and have been instead pulled from our curriculum. So it's up to you as a public health care professional to be skeptical, to ask questions, to get the full answer, to dig deeper and not just see things uh, as they are on the surface. Now, we're going to start with you. Who is the most important person in the scene of any emergency? You are. Without you, everything falls apart. We want to assure your safety so you can go home at the end of your shift and be with your family. Now, that's important. Understand how the system works, how to, the nuances of it, but also you have to prepare yourself for work. And wellness is a key component of the EMT. And you know, we kind of put that aside. We have the three major food groups. We have coffee, we have cigarettes, and we have Chinese food, right? But that's not really what's going to keep us healthy. We have to have well-balanced meals. We need to be able to exercise, and more importantly, be able to have periods of relaxation. If you, if you uh, do things like meditation, even for 20 minutes, it's known to relieve stress. But working in our industry where we can easily do a 24 to 36 straight hour shift, that, that can sometimes cause a lot of stress. We have to practice safe lifting techniques because really back injuries are the leading cause of disability in our industry. We need to be able to sleep. Even if you're a night shift worker, you have to learn your sleep patterns when you come home from work. You have to develop that circadian rhythm that allows for your balance, being able to get at least seven hours of sleep a day is vital for your overall well-being. We talk about body substance isolation, we talk about wearing uh, goggles when we intubate or when we're doing airway management and having a face mask when we're dealing with somebody with a, with a potential communicable disease, and that's fine, that's exterior disease prevention. But what about internal disease prevention? What about knowing what your family history is? What about adjusting your lifestyle so you're not going out to the bar every single night after work? I mean, it's not, it doesn't become a part of your daily habits. And smoking, understand we're primarily a sedentary service. We sit around a lot. We're comprised of Hours of boredom interrupted by moments of sheer terror. And what do we do in our off time? We're just hanging out in the ambulance, standing around. Smoke, not good, causes clots. Big contributor to heart disease. So trying to cut down on smoking or complete cessation of smoking is really vital to your overall well-being. And be able to balance your time. You know, get a hobby that's not emergency services related. Try not to have your hobby be a volunteer firefighter and nothing else. Do something like I do, I play golf, which is boring, but you know, it has nothing to do with EMS. When you're operating as an EMT, as a paramedic, in your agency, the dynamic of the agency is usually a reflection of the community. There are different races, cultures, sexual orientations, every, everybody merges together to do a common job. Just like the people that you see out in the community. You have to be adaptable, amenable to your partners. Be effectively able to communicate well and be respectful of people in your department, in other departments, and in EMS we come in contact with all different agencies. Not just police, fire, but school security, homeless shelters, hospitals. I mean, it's, it's amazing the, the different types of industries that we interact with on a daily basis. We go to different churches, synagogues, temples. We have to be able to respect their practices, but also keep patient care a priority. So, being open-minded and not judgmental is probably the best way you can, you can work as an EMT. There's no tolerance for 
any type of harassment in this industry, not just sexual harassment. Now, there are two types of sexual harassment. There's the quid pro quo. It's I scratch your back, you scratch mine, or I will give you a promotion if that's sexual harassment. Then there's the hostile work environment. And it can not just be sexual harassment. This is a broad-based harassment, making racial insults, telling lewd jokes in front of in front of people of the other sex, just making someone feel like they're uncomfortable being at work. We have to avoid that. If you feel like you're the victim of this type of harassment, whether it's sexual or or any type of harassment, anybody's making you feel uncomfortable, you need to notify a supervisor immediately and human resources if you feel that this is something that is involving your department and you don't feel comfortable going to your supervisor. Substance abuse, unfortunately, has been a, a historical problem in our industry. It's not a rampant problem, but it still does exist and we're aware of it. And just understand that having a positive drug test can cause you to lose your job and possibly lose your license. So if you feel like you, you know somebody who has a substance use problem or you're struggling with it, you need to reach out. And there are different programs that are out there for assistance. Now, forget about the stress of we put on our bodies. Forget about the stress of the agency that we work for. I haven't even talked about the stress of what you see out there. So there are some jobs that you wish you could never see again that you, you just have to revisit in your mind over and over again. It's a very stressful job that we have, seeing things. And dealing with, with any death is serious, but really dealing with the death of a child is probably the worst thing that you can do on this job. And there are different tactics, techniques that you can incorporate to assist the family members, the parents of this dead child. Acknowledge in a quiet area that this has happened. Give them time to let it process. Don't just immediately jump in with, this is what we're going to do. Just tell them this is what's happened. And then let them process it. Have that moment of quiet. It's okay to be, to be without words for about 30 seconds. And then answer questions that they might have. Be prepared to answer questions they might have. Like what's gonna happen next? The police are gonna be here, they're gonna be to talk, talking to you about this. We're going to, we're probably gonna go, but other people are gonna come and they're gonna take care of you, but you won't be left alone. Very respectful, quiet, allow them their time to grieve. Understand that when you respond to an emergency, it's not your emergency. You're seeing people, meeting them, they might be having the worst day of their lives. It might be the last day of their lives. But you have to keep in mind that it's not your worst day. So you can bring a sense of order and stability by just realizing that that is true. I'm here to do a job. It's unfortunate that this has happened to you, but I'm going to help you any way I can. And don't allow yourself to get involved. There's one thing about being compassionate, and it doesn't have to get in the way of being professional. You can empathize with, with somebody, but you don't have to share in their grief. If you have a situation where you need to have someone come with you to the hospital, you can transport parents with their children. And you take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Even if you suspect this parent of being abusive to the child, the child is still in your care, and the parent can go with you. Okay? And try and be you know, diplomatic and understand that people's cultures can sometimes get in the way of your patient care. You need to explain that to them. You need to say, I respect your beliefs. I just need you to, I just need to explain to you that your family member is sick and this is what we need to do for them.
Pharmacology is a major component of our industry, and being able to administer medication is a right. I'm sorry, it's not a right, it's a privilege. And there are different types of ways that medication can be administered. You can help a paramedic, assist a paramedic in administering medication. You can have the patient take their own medication, or you can administer the medication yourself. And this is dynamic, it's changing constantly. The, the, pharma, the pharmacy of, of your agency is constantly changing, not just with the types of medications, you know, the brands or the way it's, it's, uh, it's actually produced and the way you deliver it, but also the types of medications. So you have to stay updated with all of your protocols, and more importantly, you have to research the medications that you're going to be administering to your patients. Find out the side effects. Find out the contraindications. So if you give a medication, you can have a conversation with, with the doctor and explain to, to him or her why you don't want to give this medication. They might not understand that this patient is having, uh, they might have an untoward reaction to the medication. It's up to you to have that knowledge. Maintain that. Being a healthcare provider and dealing with the challenges of all of these different cultures can, can get in the way of you doing good patient care. It comes down to making sure that your treatments fall within your legal obligation to do so and the ethical responsibilities that you have and understand that patients have rights. we talk about the standard curriculum in terms of the medical legal aspect of what we do as EMTs and paramedics, we need to understand that sometimes a patient can say no, but they need to be able to understand that saying no has its problems. And there are issues. We need to educate people, but stay within the medical framework and maintain their civil rights. If you follow a simple premise, which is a, do no further harm to your patient, you will go far in this industry. In school, you're taught your standard of care. Delivering it can be a challenge because it can interfere with a person's rights. So you need to have some legal skill and some legal knowledge. It all boils down to this. Consent is everything. When someone calls 911, when someone requests an ambulance, they are asking for care. They're asking for you to care for them and transport them to the hospital. When you do that, and you transport them, and you drop them off with the triage nurse, you give your report, and you leave, you have completed your contract. Okay, on paper. When you show up at scene and a patient doesn't want to go to the hospital, and you leave, it's kind of like unfinished business. You leave yourself open to a lot of liability. But understand that the patient has rights. They have a right to refuse care, even if they had asked for it earlier. They can change their minds at any time. But why don't they want to go to the hospital? Why don't they want you to render care for them? You have to make sure that they understand what would happen if they choose not to have care? And that is known as informed consent. And that's what gets us mixed up 
in the legal process, time after time, is that we feel, okay, they don't want to go to the hospital, just sign here, get a witness, everything's fine, and I'm going to go. But do these patients have any medical training and do they under know, do they understand or know the consequences to their refusal? Now there are two major types of consent. There's express consent and there's implied consent. Express consent is please take me to the hospital, please give me, help me for my chest pain. Those are easy. These patients are easy to manage, they want your help, and the vast majority of patients that you encounter are like this. They have a complaint, they requested 911, they want you to help them, and they want you to take them to the hospital. But what if a patient doesn't say, take them to the hospital? What if they're unable to speak to you? What if they're a child under the age of 18? Then we operate under what we call implied consent. We use implied consent a lot. When we take a blood pressure, we go, I'm gonna take a blood pressure now, okay? And we wait for a response. We kind of just knee-jerk this. It's part of our standard approach to patient care. We say, do you, we're waiting for the patient to say no. If the patient says nothing, then it's implied that they want their blood pressure taken. When we deal with children, anybody under the age of 18, we, we follow the wishes of the parent or, guard, or legal guardian who is at the scene. Not on the phone, not by email or text, at the scene. Now, if they're not at the scene, they don't understand what's going on. They can't give informed consent for care. And this is something you need to explain. Patience is a real virtue in our job. We need to be able to talk to the patient, talk to the family member at the scene, explain the legal process, and tell them what their rights are, and focus on this, do no further harm. Act in the best interest of the patient. Do that, you're going to be fine. Now there's some minors who don't need a parent on the scene. These are emancipated minors. And there are some states that vary, but the overall standard emancipated minor, well the obvious one is they've had a court order. A judge has decreed that they are emancipated. Some people have cards that say that, some people have paperwork that say that. Okay. That's not something that they can say, I have a court order for emancipation, and you need to have documentation with that. If you have a parent, if this, this minor has a child, not pregnant with child, has a child, they are emancipated. If they're a member of the armed forces, they're emancipated. But remember that they follow a different structure. There's a chain of command. So their commanding officer can order them to go to the hospital against their wishes. Another type of emancipated minor is someone who lives alone and can prove it. They usually show you a driver's license with a different address. Their parents confirm that they're no longer living at home. If during the day you respond to a school for a sick child, the teacher or the school nurse or school officials 
can act as parents. They are legal guardians of this child during school hours. But if you find yourself with a child at the scene of an emergency who needs emergency help, they have to go. It's, it's fallen under implied consent. Treat the patient. These patients, we, we live in a democracy, and these patients have the right to say no. It's the development of the ego. First thing that two-year-olds learn to say to develop a sense of self is the word no. People want to say no. They have a right in this country to say no. But the legal responsibility that you have is to give them an informed reason to say no. If you're dealing with a parent who's refusing the care of a minor, you need to realize that it may be a knee-jerk reaction, it might be emotionally driven, you just have to sometimes stay calm and professional and explain to the parent that this is very important. They may be in denial that their child is this sick. Now this is a rare occurrence. This doesn't always fall into the neglect category, but if you feel a parent is refusing care after you're giving an inf after you're giving them all the information that this is a dangerous procedure, this could be deemed neglect. So once again, if you tell a parent this is a serious medical issue, it has the potential to be life-threatening and the parent still doesn't want you to treat their child, we may have another problem on our hands. And at this point, you might want to get other agencies involved, including law enforcement. But definitely, when in doubt, and you need a second opinion, contact medical control. Have a doctor speak to the patient, the parent. Remember, the public sometimes sees us as ambulance drivers, which we can use to our advantage. Because they ask your advice, should I go to the hospital? Sure, I'm an ambulance driver, I'd go. You know, what are you asking me for? But if they really want to know what's going on, call the doctor. And if you ever listen to what doctors say to these patients and to these parents over the phone, they are brutal. They go, you realize that if you don't go to the hospital, I mean, this, this, you might die from this. this. We don't know what's going on. You might die. Now, that's the ultimate informed consent. I take the risk of understanding that if I don't go with you to the hospital, I might die. It sounds brutal, but it's the way you can best protect yourself legally. If they don't want to go, patient, parent doesn't want, doesn't want them or their child to go, and you've exhausted all efforts, and you have given them an informed consent, then they need to sign and make sure that all of our findings and the, the refusal to go and your physical exam and your emphasis on them going is documented. It's vital to have a witness for these, and the, probably the best witness out there is a police officer. When you're talking about our documentation, everything has to be confidential. Anytime you come in contact with a patient, it's confidential. If you happen to know this person personally, a member of your family, it doesn't matter. The confidentiality can never be breached. You can't give copies of your ambulance report to anyone else but people who are doing direct patient care. If you're an EMT, 
you arrive on the scene and you start treating a patient and paramedics arrive and they want a copy of your report, you can legally give them that report. The reason why is the confidentiality is staying secure because these paramedics are direct patient care providers. If you are working with the police and it's a potential crime investigation and they want a copy of the report, you can't give it to them because the police are not direct patient care providers. The only way that they can get a copy of that is through a subpoena. A judge has to allow it. And more importantly, if you choose to give them a copy of your report, it can derail a criminal investigation because the report was obtained illegally. The 1996 Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, was created to protect patient care records. And not just ones gathered by EMS, but hospitals, doctor's offices, clinics, labs. All this has to maintain a strict adherence to confidentiality. Under HIPAA, patients can access their records, but they need to fill out forms. So just like the police, the patient wants a copy of their report, they can't get it. They're not direct patient care providers. They have to go to the hospital, fill out a HIPAA waiver request form, and get a copy that way. But they can't get a copy of your report. There's something known as PHI, or Protection Health Information. This is information that can be used to identify the patient. And it doesn't have to be their name. So we don't have to know someone's name to be able to access records. We just need their chart number, their PHI. Under HIPAA, we can't give out a lot of information. Under HIPAA, if you're approached by a member of the press and they want to know anything to deal with this patient that you just treated, you are limited in your response. You should not really say anything at all and instead refer them to a supervisor or a public information officer. And a public information officer's responsibility is, is uh, overseen by HIPAA as well. They can't say, we treated five patients of the Smith, five members of the Smith family for gunshot wounds, three were shot in the head and two were shot in the abdomen and the five-year-old girl is, is, uh, is shot in the head and is alive. That's more information than is needed. Limited data set under HIPAA. Now, like I said earlier, patients have the right to refuse care. And that includes CPR. The only problem is they're dead. So that falls under implied consent. Correct? So in order to circumvent this problem, we created advanced directives. And advanced directives have, it started with CPR, not wishing to have CPR performed on them, do not resuscitate orders, and it has expanded. It has become a total thing with overall care. Because the debilitating diseases such as ALS and MS, Alzheimer's, where your ability to have cognition 
and communication is impaired, you're not able to voice your consent. So while you have the ability, you prepare documents with your doctor and sometimes an attorney so that your wishes are known for when you are unable to express them. And this is known as a living will. Now in New York State, we have something called a most form or medical order life sustaining treatment. So in a living will and in a most form, the patient has the ability, before they're even a patient, to tell you exactly what they want done for them. And it's more than just CPR. It's a they don't want them in, they don't want to be intubated. They don't want um, hydration. They don't want force feeding through a GT tube. They don't want to be transported to the hospital. And we see this a lot. We'll see a patient who's debilitated with, with um, ALS, who is trapped in their body, the nurse didn't show up, patient fell out of bed, they put him back in the bed, he's fine, doesn't want to go to the hospital, but you don't know that. And under, before most forms, we would have to transport this person to the hospital needlessly and interfere with their, with their lifestyle, their care. They don't want to go to the hospital. Now with the most form, you have it in front of you. I just want supportive care. I want to be left at home. It's reviewed by a physician, so that's informed consent. Without this form in writing and valid, with out-of-hospital DNRs, there's an expiration date. With most forms, there's not an expiration date, but there's a change date where it's reviewed and change. And you can see right on the last page of the most form, the last signature, you'll see it says this form is no longer valid. If it's not there, then it's a valid form. You have to be shown this. You can't have a family member come in and say the patient has a do not resuscitate order. That is not valid unless you see it and you believe it to be valid. If you feel it's not, always err on the side of care. Do no harm. Put the patient's best interests as a priority. After your own safety, of course. Some of these patients with chronic debilitating issues, like Alzheimer's, like ALS, have health care proxies with powers of attorney. They have family members, friends, or attorneys who serve as their servant. They want, they will express their patient's wishes and make sure that their needs are met in conjunction with what they want. So, just to review, patients have the right to refuse treatment, but that right has to be an educated decision. A written order from a physician is required for DNRs. Having that physician sign gives you the understanding that informed consent and education has occurred. So you don't have to reiterate it, it's done. A physician has counseled them and has signed off on it. These things like most forms and living wills and healthcare proxies, they're changing constantly, so it's up to us, it's up to you to make sure that you're up to date with the most current guidelines. And if you ever have a doubt, remember, err on the side of the patient and begin resuscitation. If you do resuscitation and the family shows up and hands you a DNR, call medical control and see CPR.
explain exactly what happened, get a termination order, and that's the end of it. When you put your own needs ahead of the patient, you're going to find yourself potentially in a legal quagmire. And when we deal with issues of medical legal breaches, we're more inclined to end up in civil court than criminal court. Criminal court means that there was intent to injure. And I'm sure that you have no desire to intentionally injure your patient. So we find ourselves in civil court more often than not. And a violation of a civil law is called a tort. Civil cases are not brought forth by district attorneys. They are brought forth by private individuals, either the patients, their representatives, or their family members, on behalf of the patient. And what they are doing is seeking damages to make themselves whole again. They feel that you injured them. They don't have to prove intent. They just have to prove that damage was done. And they want you to get out your checkbook and write them a figure to make them better. And when we talk about medical legal, we talk about negligence. Negligence, big word. Negligence is defined as the failure to provide the same type of care that you would give to anyone else in a similar situation. In order to prove this negligence, four important aspects have to be proven. And not three out of four, all four. You have to, the jury has to ponder this and contemplate and come back with an understanding. Did the EMT have a duty to act? Did they breach that duty? Did the victim suffer damages? But those damages, were they suffered because of that breach of duty? Usually causation is the hardest to prove. It's what keeps juries deliberating for days. Most negligence suits are brought on using the theory of res ipsa loquitur, which says that a system or an EMT is liable even if the patient can't prove what type of injury they had. It's an interesting component. But once again, we talk about education and informed consent. Negligence per se is a clear violation. So you have your black and white and you have your gray. Both of these theories can bring you in to court. And remember, court is not about who's right and wrong. It's about who's got a better argument, who's got better evidence, and who's able to prove their case to 12 members of a community, 12 citizens, with little to no legal training. So you never want to find yourself in this situation. The most common that we have, really, is the contributory negligence. There is an assumption, yes, that the victim was injured. We get that. However, the paramedic, when they responded, caused further damage. Let 
let me just skip back a slide. There are two types of errors that fall under this contributory negligence. There is known as an error of omission, and there's an error of commission. An error of omission means that a skill was not performed. An error of commission was that the skill was performed, but it was done improperly. So an example of an error of omission is an EMT responding to a car accident, finding a patient in the front seat of the car complaining of neck and back pain, and electing to not use a KED to extricate them. The patient goes to the hospital where they develop tingling in their legs, and they sue, saying that the EMT contributed to this. The car accident was probably the primary cause of the neck and back pain, but the tingling in the legs and the loss of, of uh, the ability to walk for three months was brought on by the error of omission of not putting on a KED. Another type of lawsuit would be if a patient was being treated for a seizure and the EMT put a non-rebreather, turn on the oxygen to 15 liters a minute, transported the patient. The patient got to the hospital, EMT looked down and saw the patient was in cardiac arrest and noticed that the bag on the non-rebreather was deflated. The oxygen tank was empty. <coughs> the contributory negligence in this case would be that the EMT suffocated the patient by putting a mask on with no oxygen. The skill was done, but it was done improperly. That's an error of commission. Now if you have if you have um, an action, they call they refer to this as a feasance. F E A S A N C E. A feasance is an improper act. And you can have a non-feasance, which is that error of omission, the KED that I've discussed. You can have a misfeasance, which is putting on the oxygen mask, but not realizing that you ran out of oxygen. And then there's malfeasance. And a malfeasance is doing a medical procedure to injure the patient. And there's a different way you can do that. Giving the wrong medication to show that, to uh, basically uh, have an injurious effect on the patient. The patient's arguing with you, you start an IV and you give Valium. There's no indication for giving Valium, you just gave Valium to shut them up. That can be a criminal proceeding. That's a malfeasance. That's doing a skill. You did the skill correctly. You started the IV. You administered the medication. There's nothing wrong with the technical aspect of the skill. But the patient suffered. And you did it to injure the patient, not to help them. That's malfeasance. So, Know your error of omission, your error of commission, and know your feasances. Non-feasance, misfeasance, malfeasance. Malfeasance, you're probably going to end up in criminal court. Something else that can want, uh, have you wind up in criminal court is abandonment. We never leave our patient alone once we come in contact with them. It doesn't matter if you're off duty. If you're driving home from work, you have no legal obligation to stop for that 
car accident that you pass by. Even if you're dressed in uniform, you have no legal obligation to do that as an EMT. Now, once again, that's the national standard curriculum. You may be working in a rural area where that's part of your job description, that you are 24 hours on call and you have to respond to all events. That's different. But as far as the standard curriculum goes, you don't have to stop. But if you do stop, or you're obligated to through your job, then you have a duty to act. And then you are working as if you were on duty. Just understand that once care is started, you can't stop until someone shows up with equal or higher training. For paramedics that are operating off duty, you're an EMT, and that's it. Remember what we what we say and what we write is a legal document. If it's not true, it's a breach of not only patient communication, but it is a legal issue that can that is actual tort. It can also be construed as a criminal offense, depending on the severity. We have libel if spoken slander, I'm sorry, libel if written, slander if spoken. I just remember slander spoke, both start with an S. Defamation can come from giving false statements to the police about what you found at the scene before they arrived, to, to the nurse, in triage, doing your report, to medical control, to a family member, all different that's all different types of false statements that are spoken. Writing something on your ambulance report can be libelous if it's not true. If you didn't do a skill and you document that you did, it's libelous. You lied about your treatment. If you say something improper, you write something improper about what you found when you arrived on the scene to make sure it matches your treatment or your or the patient's refusal for care, that's libelous as well. Falling under the umbrella of consent, when you choose to continue doing a procedure, even though the patient didn't want you to do it, but you feel it's important and you're working in what you feel is the best interest of the patient, you can still be found guilty of three types of serious offenses. Assault, battery, and kidnapping. Now, battery is the easier one. Battery is a situation where I don't want my blood pressure taken. Well, I have to take your blood pressure. Well, don't touch me. I don't want you touching me. And you take the blood pressure anyway. That's illegal, unlawful touching. Assault is where the patient feels as if they are in danger. They're threatened. It doesn't have to break skin, you don't have to lay your hands on the patient. Just the act of threatening them can be deemed assault. And it could be something simple as, if you don't go to the hospital with us, or if you don't let me start an IV, all right, I'm going to slap you around. You understand me? That's assault. You don't even have to mean what you say. It's what the patient interprets, and that's very scary. And kidnapping falls under patient not wanting to go to the hospital and you instead tying them down and making them go against their will. So you can see there's a, a lot of problems that we have, especially when it comes to refusals. 
patient doesn't want to go to the hospital, you open yourself up for negligence if you don't make sure they have an informed consent. But if they, they don't want to go even after informed consent, even after a physician says so, you don't have the right to force them to do anything. And this falls under not just the legal obligation that you have, but your ethical responsibilities to your patient. Ethics is the understanding of what's right and what's wrong. And if, if you understand that you have moral obligations to your patient, if you have, um, you have to maintain a professional demeanor at all times, this is the nature of the job. If you maintain that ethical responsibility and inform this patient it's not the right thing to do not to go to the hospital, they really should go with, with you to the hospital and they still don't want to go, you still need to make sure that all of your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted. You have to get in touch with medical control. You have to have a police officer on the scene. Someone who's going to bear witness that you did the right thing. So these are your ethical responsibilities. And you need to meet them with every patient contact. And that's why we talk about a universal approach to patient care. Every single patient is addressed the same way. And it all starts, of course, with your safety. Making sure it's safe enough for you to enter. Meeting your patient's needs is vital. So here's our table. So you want to consider all options available to you and the consequences of each option. Now, which decisions have been made in the past regarding a similar situation that you might ask? What's happened before in the past? A lot of times these patients have chronic issues. These especially are the ones who don't want to go to the hospital. So they have a more thorough understanding of their refusal. You can draw that out. Is this type of problem that reflects a rule, law, or policy? If it does, you need to get other people involved. You don't want to breach policy. You want to call for a supervisor and let them work it up the chain of command. Have them make the decisions. Can an existing policy rule be applied? Possibly we may have to write new policy. This is a dynamic industry. You look at number three, how would this action affect you if you were in the patient's place? Put yourself in their shoes. They're scared. They're intoxicated. Can they make decisions on their own? They're 14 years old. Think about when you were 14 years old how scared you were of dealing with your parents. Use that. Would you feel comfortable if all pre-hospital care providers applied this action in all similar circumstances? Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. Once again, the dynamics of this job. Number five, can you supply a good justification for your action to your peers, the public, your supervisor? This is known as a reasonable man theory. What you're doing here in this job, can you explain it to 10 reasonable people? Does it make sense what you're doing? This is where your emotions have to be in check. Your professionalism has to come in. Can I explain my actions to my supervisor? Number six, how will the consequences of your decision provide the best overall benefit in view of all the alternatives that you are aware of. I say that you're aware of because there are a million alternatives that are out there that can, that can affect the outcome of, of the patient contact that you're having. And most importantly, get people involved. We're EMTs. We're paramedics, we're certified, we're not licensed. We operate under the license of our medical director. So if we do something wrong, 
If we do something that we're not sure of and problems occur as a result, not only are we in trouble, our medical director's in trouble. So get the medical director involved. Get online medical control. Have the doctor converse with the patient. This is what they're paid to do. So merging all of these medical legal aspects and most importantly ethical treatment of patients allows for what we call good therapeutic communication. And the National Standard Curriculum has, has really enforced and, and uh, solidified therapeutic communication as part of all curriculums now, from EMR to paramedic. Being able to talk to a patient, and usually the best medicine is a nice, calm voice. You need to reduce stress. And by reducing stress, let the body start working to repair itself, to heal itself. But this is a complex process. There are ways that we can do it, both verbally and non-verbally. We need to be able to talk to patients, but more importantly, be able to let them talk to you. There are different factors that, that can uh, help or hinder communications. Age, cultural issues, patient's inability to make eye contact, uh, voice tempo, tempo, posture, volume of the voice, everything is taken into effect, into account. Now there's something called the Shannon Weaver communication model. And all it is, it's like throwing a football. So, you are the sender. You take that thought, that football, and you send it, you pass it, to the receiver. The receiver catches the football. Okay, they have cognition. They caught the idea, the message. Okay, then they create their own response to that message, and they send the football back. So that's the process of good therapeutic communication. That's, the, that's really the baseline. That's the structure. Talking, sending, receiving, listening. Having the ability to do both is vital in our industry. We avoid tunnel vision this way. We're able to take in everything that's being said. Family, friends, witnesses, everything. We're taking it in. You got to realize that in this model, you're the receiver. You're trying to draw out information and it's pulling into you and you're going to make your diagnosis based on the information that you received. What happens a lot of times, especially if you're having a bad day, the information you receive, that the only one that you get is what you got from dispatch. 18 year old female, difficulty breathing, anxiety, productive cough, you've already made your decision of what's going on. You have to avoid that. You have to avoid that. You can find out that you just have one patient, possibly having trouble breathing, maybe a little anxiety on board. So this is all information. But you can't make a diagnosis based on what a dispatcher tells you. You have to arrive on the scene with an open mind. Take in everything that's going on. deal with different cultures and some cultures don't communicate well outside of their sect, their organization.
They rely on other people to communicate for them. This can be a challenge to us, but it's not going to prevent us from doing good patient care. The best way to handle it is to allow yourself to receive through that cultural issue. Not force yourself upon the culture. That's only going to lead to lack of information. So, we don't want to be ethnocentric. We don't want to use our own beliefs and project it out to the patient and the family and anybody else who's there. Remember, in the model, we're the receivers of information. We're the receivers. We don't send that out. We don't force our values on other people. We accept it because the goal is to gather information and treat appropriately. As receivers, we want to get information. So the questions that we ask are going to be open-ended. We don't want yes or no's. We want stories. We want the patient, family, friends, bystanders to tell us the story. So we ask open-ended questions. What seems to be bothering you? Why did you call for your grandmother? What's going on today? Starts a story. Close-ended questions tells your story to the patient. Are you having trouble breathing? Yes. I can make anybody have a heart attack by simply talking to them in this way. Are you having trouble breathing? Is it hard for you to catch your breath? It looks like it's hard for you to catch your breath. Are you having any chest pain? It looks like you have, have you ever had chest pain before? You did? I mean, not anxiety, but I mean, you know, chest pain? Yeah? Let's say you're short of breath and chest pain. You cannot be the sender of information. You're the receiver of information. With verbal communication, there's also tactile communication. But this is something that is limited and focused to certain areas of the body. And you need to have already established trust with the patient and the family in order to use this type of gentle touch. And what the slide shows are really the two areas that are acceptable for tactile communication. It's the shoulder and the hand. That's it. Now you look at these three people and tell me about, in your mind, what are you thinking about as far as their ability to communicate? The gentleman on the left is smiling, happy. He is somebody who is more prone to give you an entire story, a good presentation, to tell you exactly what's going on. Very helpful. His eye contact, his body mechanics shows you that he is a good sender of information. The gentleman in the center may or may not be a good sender. He doesn't look like he wants to make eye contact. Does this mean that you can't get him to communicate with you? No, but it's gonna be a little challenging. And the child on the right is looking for help. Is not going to give you any real verbal communication and information. But instead, you're gonna to need to rely on your clinical skills to determine why this child is in distress. There are physical factors in nonverbal communication. Noise plays a big thing, the lighting. And you try and get people to do good communication with them, the quieter the better. Alone in a room is great. 
alone in the back of your ambulance, is probably the best place to gather information. The, the yeah. lighting, the space, but also the fact that the patient is sitting in almost a medical office. And when they're in this setting, they tend to understand that they're getting medical care. And they will talk to you more truthfully about what's going on. So the, the idea that we in EMS have, the goal, is not initially to get them to the hospital. It's to get them to your ambulance. Get them inside your ambulance so you can do good, thorough assessments and get a good story. U.S. Census report shows that in 2010, the last census, six out of every ten patients that we encounter are over the age of 65. And in, in um, seven years, by 2020, it'll be eight out of every ten. We're an aging population. We're living longer than any other generation before. And as a result, we're having more contact with the elderly. So understanding how to communicate with these patients is vital for your overall care and should be incorporated into your universal approach. And, we, and part of what we say, the best way to deal with these patients, is never make assumptions. Never assume that they're senile or confused. If they're hostile, irritable, don't make an assumption that this is normal. If you have an Alzheimer's patient who's chronically confused and they suddenly have a change in mental status, it could be something as simple as a urinary tract infection. But what's happening is they can't voice their pain and their complaint. They don't understand it so instead, they become irritable and lash out. How are we going to find out what's truly going on with this patient? We have to take them to the hospital. So our approach is always to get them into our ambulance. When you interview an elderly patient, identify yourself. Don't assume the patient knows who you are. And by identifying yourself, I'm the EMT, I'm a paramedic, I'm with the ambulance department, the doctor sent us, your, your daughter sent us, whoever. Explain why you're here, how you got here, and who you are. Look directly at the patient. Don't show any signs of frustration. You're there to help them. Speak slowly and distinctly. Don't have to yell. You just have to talk. Talk directly at them. Show them respect. They're not honey or sweetie. They're Mr. or Mrs. And understand, you've got to be patient. You can't show your frustration because sometimes it will be frustrating. You can't show your frustration. You have to be a good communicator. You have to realize what the overall goal is. If the caregiver doesn't want this person to go to the hospital, then they have to be informed. If there's a, a most form that's presented to you, they are informed. If the person's alone and is, giving, is, is not understanding and you don't want to be accused of kidnapping them, call for a supervisor call for the police. Get other people involved. Now inversely, children are extremely challenging in a different way. Fear is expressed in children more often than anybody else. They're afraid of you. They don't want to talk to you. 
So most of your assessments are done from a distance of six feet sometimes. Children are going to be frightened. They're frightened by your uniform. They can be frightened by the ambulance. But they can also be fascinated by it. So you have to make that six-foot assessment of your patient. thing is with children you have um, the ability to make these six foot assessments and look at them because I have never met a two year old that I was ever able to sneak up on unless they were sleeping but an alert conscious two year old playing in their room when I walk in with my radio and my, my 4D cell mag light I am a fascinating person to that child. If that child does not respond to me, does not recognize that I am in that room, that is a red flag. I don't have to touch the patient to know that I have a sick child. When I'm treating patients, when you're out there working with them, protect their modesty. Be professional and friendly. Maintain eye contact. And unlike any other patient, you can go eye to eye level, it settles down their nerves. You know, you can be comfortable going eye to eye with them. Don't tower over them. You might be sometimes three times their size. So you have to be careful of that. Hearing impaired patients, they're, they're not embarrassed by the fact that they're hearing impaired, they're intelligent, they're able to express themselves. Okay. Um, so, almost all of them are able to read lips, even when, you, when they haven't been trained in it. So, position yourself so they can see you speaking. Hearing aids, um, take precautions with them. Realize that you might not even see some of them. They have new cochlear implants that are out there. You, you might not even know that they have them. But, you know, you never want to lose them if you see one. Maintain, be cognizant of it. When you get to the hospital, make sure that the patient still has it. Things you can do to help you is writing. Um, if they're able to read lips well, speak slowly and distinctly, never shout, and listen carefully. And these are some sign languages that you know that, that can be very helpful. So the one on the left, is the sign for sick, the center is the sign for hurt, and the one on the right is the sign for help. Visually impaired patients, same thing. They're able to communicate verbally. There's an issue with them not being able to see you clearly, which can get in the way of patient care. So you need to be careful and be very direct. Explain everything that you're going to do for them. Try and stay within physical contact. This is where tactile is okay. And when we talk about the hand and the shoulder for good tactile touch, you can now include the entire arm for a visually impaired patient. And you can do that to guide them to the ambulance, you can do that to make to let them know that you are there with them. Guide dogs are able to be transported in an ambulance. They're an essential part to this person's daily routine. And if they don't want to take the dog with them to the hospital, just understand that the dog is allowed. Department of Health standards says a guide dog is a, is the only animal allowed. Any type of therapy dog is allowed in the ambulance. And it's also allowed in the hospital. So there's never going to be an issue with, with that dog remaining with the patient. But if they choose not to go with the dog, it's a rare occurrence, but you have to arrange for care of the dog. You don't know how long this person is going to be in the hospital. Non-English speaking patients, find a way to obtain a medical history from someone who is bilingual. Normally, the the best source of bilingual translation in a house is a child. The child 
will speak the language of the house, and especially a school-age child will speak the language in school. So they're English and foreign language translation. And the great thing about children is they'll tell you exactly what they said. They won't make a nuance and try and make it their own message. So whatever their parents said to them in, in their native language, they will relate to you in English exactly word for word. So you don't have to worry about that. Great translation tools. So, okay, so we've, we've assured that we're safe, we've taken care of our patients, we've um, been good communicators, good receivers of information, we've made a good diagnosis, we've convinced the patient that a hospital stay is warranted in this case, we take them down to the ambulance, drive them to the hospital, and we think that our responsibility is over, not just yet. We have to deal with the hospital and the healthcare professionals who are now going to be taking over care. So, your handoff to a patient is someone of at least equal training. Some hospitals have employed paramedics to serve as triage officers. And they work in the ambulance triage and they, it's easier to make communication with a paramedic they know the information, they understand the, the job that you're going through, and um, it's, a, it's a good way to communicate. A lot of hospitals are finding this out now, so it's something that um, you might see more and more of in the coming years. But generally, we hand off to a registered nurse. We don't hand off to the unit clerk, somebody with less medical training than we have. Even if the unit clerk is an EMT as a volunteer, on the side, outside the hospital, they're not hired as an EMT. So it's either someone of equal or higher. And as far as the, the um, national model, an RN is categorized as a higher level of care than a paramedic. Giving your oral report is gonna consist of what you found, the detailed information of what you've done, patient's information, their response to treatment, vital signs before treatment, vital signs after treatment, and any other information that is, is asked of you, or any special information that the hospital needs to know. And once again, there's therapeutic communication with hospital staff. And you know what the therapeutic communication is? We're still receivers. We're going to get information, we're going to give information to the nurse on their timetable. If you just blurt out your entire report, the nurse has done 50 assessments in the last half hour, they have no idea what you just said. So what will happen is they'll walk over to the patient, get the story from them. And for, I, for one, get very upset about that, and I'm sure you do too. So. Give the nurse the information on his or her timetable, whatever they have, whatever procedure they have. They open up the electronic chart, patient's name, date of birth, allergies, medications, and then you tell your story. They become a better receiver when you follow their protocol. So let's talk about these patients that we're going to encounter. They come in all shapes, sizes, colors, ages. We need to be able to treat them the same, incorporate your standard approach. Bottom line is we evolve. We're, this body model is about 10,000 years old, but it grows over time. It has an average lifespan of 80 years. And during that average lifespan, things change. It's going to affect your care, but not your overall approach. So infants, one month to one year, these are when you are hypermetabolic. They are growing at an exponential rate. Very high pulses on birth, 
respiratory rates as well, extremely high, because they're growing quick. Shortly after birth, the pulse rate is going to drop, and the newly found respirations, because in utero, when this child was a fetus, it wasn't breathing. It was getting oxygen from its mother. After a year, respiratory rates begin to slow down. Blood pressure will correspond with the patient's weight, but we in emergency medicine really don't take blood pressures on infants. It's difficult, unless you're in a critical care arena, and you're doing a neonatal transport or pediatric transport. But really the way we can tell perfusion is through capillary refill. Cap refill has to be less than two seconds. Weights of infants vary. An average neonate will weigh between six and eight pounds. That's three to three and a half kilos. But they grow about 30 grams a day. So at the end of the first year, the weight has tripled. It's an exponential change. This is a hypermetabolic state. So the child is always going to be tachycardic, and they're always going to be tachypnic. They're going to be higher oxygen demand. Think about that. Higher oxygen demand for a neonate and infant. These patients are primarily nose breathers. Less than six months are prone to nasal congestion because they breathe through their nose so rapidly. It gets inflamed. The rib cage is present, but it's not protective. It's supple. It still has um, osteoblasts, not osteoclasts as far as, as far as bone cells. Bone cells have not become rigid yet, so it's supple. Remember, children, their heads are much bigger than the rest of their bodies. That's known as being disproportionate. So because it's disproportionate, the head's going to flex forward if the child's laying flat. So we want to address airway management concerns right off the bat. That should be your priority. For the nervous system, they have something known as the moral reflex, where they the neonate less than a month will open their arms wide, spread their fingers, and it looks like they're trying to grab things when you catch them off guard. They, sh they shudder. That's a moral reflex. And when you touch a, an infant's palm with your finger, the, the hand will grasp without the child even knowing about it. That's called a palm or grasp. The child won't even be looking at you when that happens. Um, a rooting reflex, when, when you touch a neonate's cheek, they'll turn their head towards the touch. That's a rooting reflex. A sucking reflex, when you stroke a neonate's lips, they, begin, they, it, they feel like they're about to breastfeed. Because of the quick development and the, and the uh, bones are not fully developed, this is also true with the skull. The skull is not completely encased yet. It's not solidified. So the sutures are not sealed together. Sutures are open, and those open sutures, um, fissures in the brain, are known as the fontanelles. Children are born with what's called natural immunity. It's a database for their white blood cells to fight infection. They know how to do it for specific microorganisms. And mom passes her immunity to child through that process known as natural immunity. Anything after that is known as acquired immunity, getting shots, getting immunized, getting a disease, getting something like chickenpox develops your acquired immunity, but you start off with a common database, and that's known as a natural immunity. So here's an example of what we're talking about fontanelles. So it's very careful to manipulate a child's head. You don't, you can actually shift these fontanelles and cause the equivalent of a skull fracture. So you have to be very careful holding a child's head. And you see, the first year of development is the fastest. Break down. After two months, they can recognize faces and they can track objects with their eyes. They're developing their cranial nerves, their ocular motor nerve. They're able to move their eyes.
drives back and forth to follow and track. At three months, they bring objects to their mouth. Some, some scientists theorize that this is how babies feel with their tongue. The glossal, hypoglossal are sensory cranial nerves that actually allow the child to feel things. It's hard for them to have tactile stimulation. At four months, they reach out to people and they start drooling. Their, their inside, their upper glass is starting to form. Five months, they sleep through the night and they're, they don't have stranger anxiety, but they look for family members in a group of faces and they can point them out. At six months, they start teasing and they sit upright. Teasing, I suppose. They sit upright. Seven months, they're afraid of strangers now and they begin irritability usually comes with teething, that's the first time they have pain. So they, they're starting to be a little irritable. Eight months they can sit alone and they start being able, now they have better tactile stimulation, better tactile, so they can they play with things by themselves. They're exploring in nine months, but they can now lift themselves up. They've, they've started to, their muscles are starting to develop to the point where they can raise their head up their sternocleidal mastoids. At 10 months, they respond to their name, and they're able to crawl. At 11 months, they're able to now walk, and they don't like restrictions. They're out to explore. Their brains are a blank database waiting to be filled up with knowledge. And at 12 months, they can react to their name, and there's some elements where they can actually understand speech and language. In order for all this to happen in this time frame, there has to be stimulation from the, an external source, and that is from another human being. Parents, guardians, someone's got to be there with the child to allow the child to develop. The child can't really develop if they're left alone. After we've left infancy, we're moving on to toddlers, one to three years. You see hemodynamically our pulse is dropping, our respiratory rate is dropping, our blood pressure is starting to become prevalent, you know, with 80 to 100 systolic, but still capillary refill is the best way to estimate, you know, the um, hypoperfusion. And body temperatures can fluctuate a little bit. Once again, hypermetabolic, they're still growing. Preschoolers, three to six, now their pulses are, are about the same, their respiratory rate is starting to drop a little bit, and their blood pressure is pretty much the same. Once again, cap refills. Um, they lose that passive immunity. This is when they start getting their shots. They're, they're starting to have acquired immunity. At this age also, they begin to talk. And like I said earlier, the first word that they usually say is no. No is the development of the ego. To know that you are singular, I have as I want to say something, is to disagree. Disagreement spurs debate. And even if you agree with that person, you want to spur debate, you say no. Children develop that early. That is the sense of self. They're beginning to have social interaction. They like to play with other children. They still want to be around their parents, but they're beginning to like to have a social circle of their own kind. They also understand what happens if they do something wrong. Cause and effect. Touch a hot stove, you burn your hand. They won't touch the hot stove again. At six to 12 years, now we're really kicking into social awareness. And you can see that the hemodynamics are starting to stabilize. This is where blood pressures are indicated. And capillary refill is not as effective anymore. School aged children will undergo growth spurts. Four pounds or two kilos, two and a half inches or six centimeters every year. The baby teeth fall out, the permanent teeth come in, and at this age, this is when the skull is adult size. 
So these children have big heads, disproportionate to their body. I always like to say, when you're looking at kids like this, you think about South Park, think about Cartman, big heads, low body, stubby little legs. So as EMTs, the real challenge to us is airway management. This is when, at this age, they begin to have rational thought and reason. They start to bargain. You know, uh, can I stay at my friend Kenny's house tonight and I promise I'll, I'll do my chores tomorrow. They understand consequences. And this is interesting because when you're dealing with these, this age group as patients, you need to explain what you're going to be doing to them. The consequences are not, we're going to take you to the hospital, but you know what, you're not going to get a shot. I won't give you a needle unless you really, really need it. And I'll let you know if I do that, okay? You understand that? You could say it to a one-year-old, but you can say it to a seven-year-old. Adolescents, now their bodies are, are close to adult structure. Um, their vital signs have definitely leveled off. And it, it, it's something where a lot of it, in agencies treat them like adults, clinically. In New York City, most of our protocols, an adult is someone over the age of 14. They can't make decisions like an adult, but you treat them clinically as if they are. It's when they're going through hormonal changes. The endocrine system is really firing away. So they're going to have um, secondary sexual development, and you know they're going to men are going to grow hair, women are going to start growing breasts. So this is when they begin the hormonal changes. This is when women first start having menstrual cycle. They've they've begun production of estrogen, progesterone. Men, this is when they're beginning the body hair. That's the sign of testosterone. There are the changes psychosocial. This is when they're in conflict with their parents. Privacy is a major issue for these for these patients. And while they're risk takers, they don't want to be permanently disfigured. They hate the idea of scars because that would ostracize them from their social circle. So that information is vital for us as healthcare providers. Because if we go to a car accident and there's a 15 year old there and they're very upset and they got a cut on their head and they don't want to go to the hospital and you tell them, look, if you don't get that cut treated correctly, it's gonna scar. Something as simple as that can convince them that going with you to the hospital is in their best interest. Part of being a social circle is having an antisocial attitude. Nonconformity is a form of conformity. So you have the nonconformist groups that are grouped together, and you have people that you know, is the experimental drugs, smoking, their eating disorders. There's a code of ethics. They break into clans, and each clan has its own ethics. But because they have this clan-like mentality that they've just started developing, where they have us versus them. This can lead to psychiatric issues, high risk of suicide and depression in this group. Now, early adults, college level and beyond. People entering the workforce. Right now, this is more, their social circles are gonna be a little bit different. Hemodynamically, they're adults. Between 1925, the body's functioning at an optimal level unless there are issues, there are congenital issues, asthma, um, any type of underlying heart disease that is congenital, like valvular problems, things like that. Outside of that, the body is in peak physical shape. And life no longer centers around school. You know, these are the same people who thought that they would, they would um, live and die with their high school friends. Now when they hit this, 
this age group, it's more their work friends because their social circles are now part of their work environment. People who share the same interests, not just people who live on the same block. Middle-aged adults between 41 and 60, vital signs once again level off and we can start having some problems. We might have some, um, not, not congenital that you have in the 19, 25 year olds, but now um, stress response issues and disease states. This is where cancer probability increases. With women, menopause kicks in. Menopause is basically they've run out of eggs. So there's no more production of progesterone estrogen and we, we have a drop off. We have hormonal changes. Common problems in addition are diabetes, hypertension, okay, and a lot of this is, is secondary to weight issues. So these patients, these people, they focus on life goals at this point. High risk of depression if those life goals have not been met. There's a readjustment lifestyle. A lot of them have had children that have now left the home, and they may be taking care of both college children and elderly parents. So there's a lot of stress in this age group. In our late adults, 61 years and older, this is where it becomes a real challenge for them because now body systems are starting to break down slowly. Vital signs are, they're, they're varied. There's not a standard set. They vary with their overall health, medications that can affect their hemodynamics, any, any medic, uh, medical problems. Lots of times you'll see congestive heart failure, COPD, stroke. All these are part of their daily activity that has changed the structure of their bodies. Cardiovascular disease, um, you're going to start seeing changes because the body is starting to develop, to adjust and adapt to the disease part through atherosclerosis, um, enlarged left ventricle, through uh, chronic hypertension, congestive heart failure, all of these issues. Uh, the vascular system is literally becoming stiffer the ability to produce replacement blood cells because of the hormonal changes has been altered. So a lot of times you'll see anemia as a common disease across this population. The size of the airway begins to increase, the surface area, the alveoli decreases, precursor to COPD, the natural elasticity of the lungs decrease, it starts to get hardened. So Breathing looks, what normal breathing for a patient like this would look like distress for someone who was younger. Aspiration, the ability that the cough reflex is not as good, it's not as pronounced as it was when they were younger, so the threat of aspiration is higher. Like I said earlier, the hormonal system, the endocrine system starts to change. Insulin production drops off. They have to be more um, aware of their diets. Type 2 diabetes is very prevalent in this community. The metabolism begins to drop off. So they slow down their physical activity. But a lot of times they don't decrease their food intake. And that is a precursor to type 2 diabetes. So what, you, what you're going to see a lot with these patients is um, they're either extremely thin because they don't have the drive to eat or they're overweight because they continue eating it like they're used to but they don't have the insulin response so they retain sugar. Women, the, the uterus and, and the uterus begins to shrink. It's no longer in use. It's not, it's not undergoing that 28 day cycle that it was used to. So now it's a muscle that's not used anymore so it becomes atrophy. Things start to decrease, taste sensations, saliva secretion, the intestines um, don't have the same motility, they don't move food like they used to. Uh, gallstones are very common in this group and there's 
the anal sphincter changes and there's fecal incontinence. So you see a lot of these um, folks wearing diapers as a result. For the kidneys, the filtration drops. I think you kind of get the idea that everything's getting really bad and starting to break down as you get older. It's not going to come back. And that's an important thing to understand. This is something that families need to be counseled about, patients need to be counseled about. Some of them already know that. It's not going to get any better. Your care is going to be more about maintaining their standard today than curing. Okay, they, while they have um, neuroplasia, they have issues where the uh, neurons are not working, that doesn't mean they have a loss of knowledge or skill all the time. Right? Sleep patterns will change. They'll, they'll get maybe five, six hours of sleep, wake up at five o'clock in the morning. As the brain shrinks sometimes, it can leave this potential space that can be replaced with blood. It, and they're very prone to subdural hematomas as a result. Now with sensory changes, vision and, and auditory, those are usually the last to go and a lot of elderly patients can see clearly and hear fine. Um, but if they're going to lose one over the other, it's always going to be hearing before vision. But once again, glaucoma plays a big factor, um, underlying medical history, diabetes, a lot of things can lead to issues with visual impairment. These patients are aware of their problems. They're very cognizant of them, but towards the end of their lives, they begin to lose brain function. And what they found is usually in these healthy patients with very few underlying illnesses like CHF or COPD, they usually, when the brain goes after five years of that brain dysfunction, Alzheimer's, senility, dementia, that's when the body collapses. we're doing our medical terminology, when we're doing documentation, we need to understand the language of medicine. We don't point to areas, we know areas and can describe it because we have to talk to some people over the phone. So we need to have a knowledge of anatomy. And anatomical references are derived from um, the ancient and dead Greek and Latin languages. Understanding this terminology, you got to break it down into four important categories. You have the, the um, what follows a word, a prefix, what ends a word, a suffix, the root word itself that has a prefix or a suffix attached to it, and then the ability to combine root words together, like cardiovascular, respiratory. So the main part of the, of the word is the root. That's the word itself. It's the essential meaning of what you're trying to say. And all medical terms will have at least one root word in it. Now when you combine root words, it's usually with an O, but also sometimes an I. For example, gast, which is a root word for stomach, and enter, which is the root word for intestines, and an O is necessary. So you can see how gast and enter, enter is linked together with the O. Gastro, enter, and itis, is the suffix that means infl inflammation of. So gastroenteritis is inflammation of the stomach and intestines. A prefix is something that precedes a word, and it's not that common, but it can still exist. 
it's going to change the meaning of the word. That's the important thing. So a suffix will describe it, a prefix will change the meaning. So pnea is Greek for breathing. Different prefixes alter the, the root word breathing. So a is no. Pnea is breathing, no breathing. Dis is a prefix meaning difficulty. Pnea, dyspnea, difficulty breathing. Brady means slow. Tack means fast. So bradypnea is slow breathing. Tachypnea is fast breathing. So the standard prefixes are there. Those four standard prefixes are what you see. Another one that's not in there is U. EU means normal. So eupnea is normal breathing. But if you know A, dis, brady, tack, you're good with your prefixes. Okay, it's going to indicate location, intensity, direction, number, time, position. It, it means a lot. It can alter those root words. And there's a list of common prefixes that we see. Okay, like I'll throw a couple of them out. Contra means against, contraindication. Di means twice. Dia means through. Extra means outside. Homeo means the same or like. Post is after, pre is before. And you get the idea. Suffixes, word element that appears at the end of the word. It's going to change the meaning of the word, but it's also going to describe the issue. So, hamat means blood. Ologist is a specialist. So, hematologist is someone who specializes in blood disorders. Neuro means brain. An ologist is specialist. A neurologist is someone who specializes in the nervous system. Now, if you have ology, that's the study of. So, neurology or hematology on the slide is the study of hematology or neurology. All right. So, this indicates more more often than not a procedure. It doesn't so much alter the word; it it describes the word in definition. So this is a list of all of your suffixes, and just to hit a couple, um, you're looking at airy is pertain to, um, dipsia is thirst, thynea is pain, itis of course talking about inflammation, a tumor is followed by ulma. Neuroma, okay? And then we have our other common suffixes. So having an understanding of all of these additions to the root word to give it this explanation is going to allow you to speak the language of medicine. Something else we can do when we document, this is the documentation is to use abbreviations. Don't have a lot of space to document, so it is acceptable to use some abbreviations. But not every abbreviation is acceptable because some abbreviations mean other things. So we don't use this for speaking, just for writing. So when you're defining medical words, you got to look for the suffix. Okay, identify the root word and identify exactly if there's a prefix and put it all together. So looking at the root word and seeing the suffix, make sure you understand that. And when two root words are linked together by an O or an I, you understand that that's a dual system being described. So hypoglycemia, the root word is glyce, which is sugar. Hypo is low, hypotension, Hypovolemia, hypo is low. Emia is a blood condition. So hypoglycemia 
is low blood sugar in the blood. And gastroenteritis, remember we got those two root words, gastro and enter. So gastroenteritis, that's abdominal, that's stomach and intestines. And inflammation is itis. We can build medical words. You can discuss, have discussions and understand meanings of departments and their, their um, effects and what services they provide. And we talk about things like ectomies is removal of, so um, gastrectomy is removal of the stomach. Linking root words again, Luke means white, and sight means cell, so it's white cell. Osteoarthritis, combining the form for bone, arthro, with the root word for joint. Oste is bone, arth arthro is joint, and itis is inflammation, so osteoarthritis. Inflammation of the bone and joints. So, to put it all together, understand that this is a dynamic industry that we're in, and you have to, after protecting yourself, the most important person at the scene of emergency, you have to have a thorough knowledge and understanding of what type of patient you have, what their medical issues are, what medications they take, what cultural um, issues they, they follow, what um, religious practices they believe in. All of this is put together and the best way you can, you can use all of these experiences, put all this together, is have that standard approach to patient care.